Savon Springer is the owner and founder of Native Assets. Any views expressed by Savon or his guests are their own thoughts and opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Native Assets or the guest's respective employer. Any guest appearance by representatives of Web3, NFT, crypto, or any other kind of organization does not constitute an endorsement by Native Assets or the guest's respective employer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be mistaken as financial advice. Always conduct your own due diligence and consult a qualified professional when considering any investments of any kind. If you've been in crypto, NFTs, Web3 for any amount of time, you have definitely uh, heard or are familiar, should be familiar with the concept of DAOs. Uh, Now, DAOs in and of themselves, the word itself stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, but, you know, it's it's, it's a lot more nuanced than that. And so today, I'm happy to bring y'all a guest who has a lot of experience, not just in crypto, Web3s, but across technology, and he's been doing this for a long time. And I think that uh, the company that he helped co-found and is leading uh, right now, uh, his talents and background really, really work well. It's a good fit. So joining us today, the co-founder, head of product, head of community at Myosin Dow, Blake Kim. What's good? What's hi, good hi. with you, bro? What's good? What's good? Thanks for having me. Excited uh, to thank chat. You. Thank you for making the time, man. I've been looking forward to this one. So uh, just out the gate, man, this is usually how I start everything. Just give the people, yeah. you know, two, three minute background on yourself and how you yeah. wound up in this this wild world of Web3. Yeah, 100%. So my back, I mean, to where I, I mean, I always like to take it back to the beginning. So I, I grew up and was raised in the D.C. area, went to school in New York, and that's kind of where I've been ever since. So I never came came here for college and I, I never left. So um you know, when I came here for school, I was still trying to figure out exactly what I want to do. I always knew I was a little bit entrepreneurial. So I was interning at a lot of different companies towards the end of my college career. Uh, there was a moment where I thought, oh, I want to go into fashion or retail. I ended up uh, interning at Ralph Lauren for a little bit. Realized just because it's a cool brand doesn't mean it's a cool company. Right. <laughs> and that's when I was like, because before that, I had been interning a lot of early stage startups. And I was like, yeah, startup life, that's what I'm about. And that's right around when direct consumer was taking off. So right after college, the first thing I did was actually uh, launch my own menswear brand. Uh, it was like a direct consumer. Um, it was direct consumer back when it was kind of like a fresh new idea. At this point, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of par for the course. Everything is direct consumer. Uh, did that uh, for about a year and a half. Uh, didn't quite work out, but it was really great learning experience. Uh, so from there, I realized I really loved building brands and brand strategy and learning, you know, what it takes to actually like build a company, you know, from a um, kind of like a more marketing storytelling perspective. So I ended up actually going into brand strategy consulting, helped launch uh, the New York uh, office of a London-based consultancy called BrandCap. And that was a really great learning experience, again, for me, just in terms of, um, you know, working directly with our managing director to kind of scale and grow that operation. So that's where I learned all about, you know, what it takes to actually create a a really awesome brand. Um, At the same time, though, consulting has its pros and cons. And then, and so because of that, I realized actually, you know, I want to go do something else. And that's actually when I ended up moving into venture design, which is what I've been doing for the majority of my career since. Uh, so uh, I ended up going to a place called Human Ventures. They were a venture studio. Now they're just a VC firm here in New York. But at the time they had a studio uh, and the venture studio model was pretty new, which is, you know, you kind of have VC firms and you have incubators, accelerators, venture studios are somewhere in between. Because what a venture studio does, it's like a VC firm, but then you actually build the companies and invest them internally, as opposed to an incubator where or an accelerator where you already have a company and you're actually just helping grow faster. At a studio, we kind of build the ideas from the ground up. So that's what I've been doing for a while now. um, You know, my past several jobs, and it's been really fun. Just you know, understanding the frameworks, the methodology of ideating, launching, testing new companies, and getting them invested. uh, and then at the end of last year, our most recent studio that I was at uh, had to shut down its New York office, took some time off, came back. Uh, and that's when my co-founder, Simon, reached out to me and said, hey, Blake, I'm starting this growth marketing DAO. Do you want to get involved? And I was like, hell yeah, that's really exciting because uh, I've been in, you know, playing around with crypto since 2017. Bought ETH, saw it rocket, uh, saw it come down, uh, kind of moved on with my life. But I think 2020, when DeFi summer hit, that's when I really, that's when I recognized like, okay, now there's a real use case. These smart contracts people have been talking about, people are actually using it for something. You know, what is a bank but a big middleman? Um, and as someone who had been big on, decent, you know, direct consumer at one point, cutting out the retail middleman, D- 
DeFi is just cutting out the financial middleman. And that that's what technology and I think the the big promise of Web3 is cutting out all these extra middlemen that have accrued over the course of Web2, whether it's Facebook, Google, banks. You know, now we can create this world where actually we can start to interact more directly with each other. Kind of bringing back that like peer to peer idea when we had mm-hmm. LimeWire and Napster, but less illegal and a lot more, <laughs> um, you know, a yeah. lot more formalized, right? And so, yeah, so that's what I've been up to is uh, we've been building my since since February, and it's uh, it's been a hell of a ride. I'm sure we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit. So, yeah, yeah, no, phenomenal summary, phenomenal summary, and I think. You know, even you making that point about direct to consumer, I've personally actually never thought about that uh, analog or that that corollary. Mm-hmm. But it's so fitting because when it first happened, that was not the way. You know, people yeah. were still going into the stores. That shopping yeah. experience was still very rooted in being there physically, and this whole idea of oh, you can just mail it to them was mm-hmm. was radical to folks. And certain yeah. industries it worked better with than others because of different logistics. You know, if you're sending yeah. clothes, that's pretty cheap to mail, but you want to send some yeah. gym equipment or something heavy, yeah. you know, now you have all these different costs and it's there wasn't the infrastructure yeah. of Amazon to get everything there in time. Yeah. And so it was all like like the mail order or you went to the store and direct right. the consumer really split that difference. And so now we're seeing the the technologies built on the blockchains that re- remove that component of trust that mm-hmm. allow you to really strip the middleman out of any process that you so see. And, um, and to your point, when 2020 came around, because it's a very, very similar story, 2017, you know, got yeah. in at the very end, like right before the last <laughs> wave, and oh, then, uh, and then yeah. got back home from a trip. And I was like, damn, all of this is down. And they say you only lose the money if you sell. So yeah. uh, at a loss, so I just held on to it. But 2019, 2020 came around, Uniswap, you know, and all these different primitives, Aave uh, really caught their stride. And so similarly, it was like, all right, boom, now's the perfect time to really drill in and and bring this information to people. So I think the the, the logical transition here is is to Mm -hmm. explain to folks what a DAO is, because in my experience and what I've seen, most DAOs exist they exist as a coordination mechanism that yeah. allows people to coordinate in a, in a direct way with each yeah. other, but oftentimes they they do serve as a community, right? Yeah. Uh, or they're yeah. for collectors. So I think of something like Please or DAO, uh, or yeah. you can look at other DAOs like Friends with Benefits that are more yeah. of a social thing and event based. But can you break down what a DAO is, um, and then yeah. we'll, we'll pull at the nuances there, and that'll lead us into yeah, uh, yeah. really setting up my own down and deeper. Yeah, I think what's interesting about DAOs is, I mean, the way I kind of see Web3 development, right, um, is, you know, like we talked about 2020, DeFi summer happens. People are like, oh, we can use smart contracts for decentralized finance. That was kind of my entry point and what's something I was really passionate about. I've always been kind of like a personal finance investment nerd. I've been trading stocks since like high school and that type of stuff, right? So this really resonated with me. NFTs were kind of the next wave. Right. Because then they're like, okay, well, now we can smart contracts for culture. Right. And that honestly is what kind of brought the mainstream in. And so it's funny, at the time I was poo pooing, I was like, this stupid DeFi is the future. NFT took off. And now in hindsight, I'm like, that makes sense. Most people don't care about personal finance as much as I might. Right. Most people care more about the fun part, uh, which is the culture. And then DAOs really, I feel like, took off, you know, middle to early, maybe late last year. Um, and they started to enter the popular narrative. I think the, the the way I would define it, I mean, you already define it, right? A DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. I think the challenge is too many people get caught up on the autonomous part or mm. the decentralized part. Really, all a DAO is, is kind of like you said, it's it's a community. Uh, I've heard a lot of people describe it as, what is it, a Discord channel with a shared bank account, right? <laughs> um, and I think it's challenging, too, because DAOs are so new as a model that nobody has really figured it out yet. Uh, and there's so many different types of DAOs, right? So like you talked about, there's investment DAOs where people pool their money together and they actually want to focus in on specific investment theses. Like, we want to buy NFTs, we want to buy real-world assets, we want to buy DeFi tokens, whatever. There are social DAOs like FWB. I would put Mice and Squarely within the service DAO element, and that's a whole other thing, right? And for me, that's where I saw, you know, as a venture designer, my brain's always thinking like, okay, but like, that's a cool technology, but how do we turn that into a real business that we can scale and turn into something awesome? And for me, I always, I saw a huge amount of opportunity because, you know, when I was playing around with DAOs last year, you know, going into all these different discords, I think there are a couple of key challenges I saw. Number one, you know, I think. And it's funny because having been in the tech scene in New York for a while, I've seen this happen a couple of times. So when like mobile really took off, I remember going to startup events and everyone's like, wow, like there's so much, 
people are just like building, everyone's building the same fucking thing, right? When DC <laughs> took off, everyone was like, there's always this unbridled optimism that comes out when a new technology is released. But I think, um, I like to think that through my experience, I was able to see very quickly, like, okay, like the Dow model is cool. But at the same time, you don't start a company and just open up your doors and ask everyone to come in and just like participate. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great idealistic view of the world. But again, having built a lot of early stage companies, I can tell you it doesn't work that way. Like, especially in the early days, you need the leadership. You need people to or like a tightening community that already exists to really drive that momentum forward. I think for things like Constitution now or, you know, ones where it's very simple, the narrative is very clear. Let's pull our money together and let's buy a certain thing. That's easy. But if you're trying to do something like a service now where you're providing real services, building a real business, that requires a, a slightly different um, structure. So basically coming in, uh, or, sorry, and just to bring it back, right? I think the opportunity I saw with DAOs was um, they're too open, right? And so what we need to do is actually there needs to be some level of quality control, right? So for us and Mayas and what we've done is it's quality over quantity. So for us uh, to actually join our DAO, uh, we have a pretty extensive screening process. Uh, depends on the skill set, right? But we originally it was kind of like one big type form. And now what we've done is as we've grown, start to specialize into the different verticals. So whether you're growth marketer, community manager, content writer, et cetera, you need to tell us everything about yourself um, in terms of your LinkedIn, email, portfolio, qualifications, background, what you're interested in. And then you need to answer some case studies too, to show you actually beyond the resume that you actually are good at what you do. Because if you do that, then we can curate and create that tight-knit community where we can actually work and coordinate on stuff together uh, and deliver work for real clients. Um, because I think that's the tricky thing is like creating a company that's totally decentralized through the internet is a fun idea, but it's incredibly challenging. And so you need these kind of like quality control elements like the vetting, like being specific about who you let in to make sure that you can actually be successful. Because the alternative is kind of what a lot of people I think have done is just like, let's just throw it all together and hope that you do this and you do this and that works, but you need organization. You know, at the end of the day, a DAO is really just using technology to organize people and people will always be people like Web3 did not change how people operate. (laughs) Right. So you still need structure. You still need leadership. You still need some level of hierarchy, right? Like who is actually owning what? Right. Uh, And to do that, people need to be incentivized and to be incentivized. You need different structures, whether it's, you know, uh, a title, whether it's compensation, whatever it is. Um, Anyways, that's kind of like my bigger rant about DAOs. I I hope that tracked. I I, I didn't go too far off. No, 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 no. no. (laughs) I think I think part of why people tune in to to listen to this is because you know, especially long form content, you make the time to really yeah. dive into some of the nuances and not just focus yeah. on, all right, what's the best way to say this in 50 characters? Yeah, um, yeah. And so I, I appreciate you you spending the time to kind of shade in the, uh, the the spaces there. So I think the natural question that would come to a lot of people's uh-huh. minds when they hear this is what you're doing effectively in a way is an agency um, in, uh-huh. in some regards. And We've had conversations, you know, uh, mm-hmm. offline, and, and maybe we'll get into some of that, what Myosin yeah, will yeah. turn into down the road yeah. that's a bit more than a DAO. But before we get there, why do this through a DAO mm-hmm. structure instead of just setting up an agency, which is yeah. something you have some experience with already? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I would say, like, that was the other opportunity. So I always say there are two, there are two key insights. Number one, DAOs weren't being leveraged effectively. Number two, the agency model in the traditional Web2 world is inherently broken. If you look at the largest agencies out there, um, for those who might be familiar, WPP, Publicis, and I always forget the, I think, oh, Omnicom. So those are the three largest holding companies for advertising and marketing agencies in the world. If you look at their balance sheets, if you look at their public statements, they're they're generally deeply unprofitable uh, and their (laughs) business model, it's it's just not good. Uh, And it, it only makes sense because typically what happens with agencies is you can have a five to 10 to 20 person agency and be profitable and be very happy and very successful. The challenge is scale, right? So the bigger these agencies tend to get, the more they become more like a Ponzi scheme uh, or like a pyramid <laughs> or pyramid scheme, basically, because the bigger they get, uh, there's all this overhead infrastructure and kind of bureaucratic waste that starts to accumulate. And mm-hmm. when you get to the highest levels, what it ends up becoming is the partners kind of skimming a lot of profits off the top. 
the agency taking all this margin in the middle, and then they rely increasingly on an army of freelancers who uh, are getting paid okay rates, if not mediocre rates, if they're not getting fucked altogether. I don't know if I could curse on this, but Absolutely. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So they're getting okay, great. Well, you but you just unleashed a monster. But, um, <laughs> no, so they're getting fucked on every angle, right? Because they're getting compensated not poorly. Uh, they don't really have benefits like healthcare, insurance, etc. They um, almost never have any type of real meaningful equity or financial upside in the business. So it's it's just a terrible model in general, right? And so what happens at these bigger agencies? The best people. Either they'll kind of stick with it and they'll work their way up, or they go off and kind of do their own thing and they start their own agency, which is why you have so many people who have like three to 10 people agencies, because it works at that scale. But for us, I think what we saw was, okay, well, now you actually using this DAO model, you know, a DAO is really just a way of kind of, like you said, it's a coordination mechanism, right? Um, we saw a lot of opportunity to actually take that and kind of flip the whole model on its head, where instead of the agency kind of taking everything, we could kind of combine the best of worlds of being a freelancer, but also be part of agency um, in the sense that when you work with us, the way we structure all of our, our projects is all of our down members for every project we win, 75% of that revenue is given to the project team. So that's a mm. huge, that's, that's a huge margin basically. So yes. you could go work on projects on your own and take hundred percent, 75% is still pretty generous. And then the other <laughs> element of it is 15% of that goes to community treasury which as a DAO member, when you join Myosin, we give you Myosin token uh, for now. You know, One day that'll change. But for now, you're given Myosin token, which gives you ownership um, in you know, Myosin in general and uh, helps you participate in determining what that community treasure is going to do. Right. So you get paid what you're worth. Um, you get to have a say in you know, what the agency actually does. You have, you know, you have, a, you have a say right? in, how, in, in governance. And then 10% goes to whoever originated the deal, uh, which we do mm -hmm. because, and that's also a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty decent commission for what it is because anyone can basically do it. So it's pretty cool. Whether you're a MISA member, whether you're just someone listening to this podcast, whoever it is, right? Whoever brings in the deal, they should get compensated for it. So that's kind of been the whole ethos is if you do the work, you should get paid for it uh, as fairly as we can create it. And so within this structure, the model's flipped, right? So to be frank, like if you look at it from a traditional PNL, like agency perspective, the DAO is not doing that well because the treasury is a lot smaller mm -hmm. than the amount of money we're giving out to our members. But if you look at it from a value created perspective and like a throughput perspective, it's incredible because it means all of our members, the bigger we get and the more projects we work on, the more they get paid and the wealth is distributed, you know, all over. Um, because I think that's the other thing we've been focused on is trying to curate like a global community of Web3 marketers, you know, marketing experts, right? Whether you're growth marketer, community manager, content writer, biz dev partnerships, influencer, um, the list goes on, right? Um, and obviously I'm biased because I come from a New York, US perspective, but there are a lot of other places in this world where, you know, what in New York might not be a lot of money is a life-changing amount of money. Um, so that's the other exciting part is kind of being able to distribute wealth all over and really create meaningful impact uh, for people who wouldn't have had access to these ty this type of work or these types of projects before Web3 or Myosin existed. Because um, otherwise, you're trying to go to these freelance marketplaces uh, like Fiverr mm -hmm. or Hired. But the challenge with those places, is it's kind of a race to the bottom, right? So yeah. everyone's competing with each other. Undercutting each other, each right? other on so the prices. Undercutting each other. And, and then the, the people who do the best work and have the highest reviews get the majority of the best work, right? So... That's why I kind of see us as this perfect middle ground of you still get to be, if you want to go and do your own freelance stuff, you're welcome to, right? But the cool part is by assembling this global, this highly vetted global talent pool of top quality marketers, we can leverage our collective brain trust and just the power of numbers, right? We can actually go and win and work on bigger and better deals than if you could on your own. And the economics are pretty good for you. Um, and you get to be a part of something bigger. So it's kind of, you get the best of both worlds without really compromising on either is the way I see it. Yeah. Hell yeah. So, uh, if I can just pull in some more minor details yeah, yeah. about that, cause I imagine some people, listening, you know, be like, damn, I need to check this out. I'm like, yo, I need to holler at you offline and, and, uh, might need to put in an application, but, yeah. um, two things that came to mind. One to start with, 
how, so let's say there are 10 verticals that y'all focus, let's say uh-huh. there's five verticals that y'all focus on, and each vertical yeah. has 10 people who've been accepted into the DAO. So you have 50 members of the DAO that are yeah. in five different verticals. What is the process of determining who works on the deal? I imagine part of it is mm-hmm. like who's available, but other than that, how do yeah. you keep it from being kind of this super competitive, yeah. you know, DAO where people are jumping in front of each yeah, other yeah. To, to be the one who gets so, to work on the deal? Yeah, so I think it's two things. So I, I, I do want to stress, like, I think the reason we've been successful to date um, is, and this is, again, I think speaking to like my previous experiences is, when we started the DAO, I'll be frank, it was pretty centralized. And to be honest, it still somewhat is. That being said, we are firmly on the path of decentralization. We have a governance guild. We're talking about what does it look like to decentralize, to start. And we're also starting to elevate our own members to become community leaders and to own different elements of the guilds. So that's all starting to happen. That being said, I think that is partly how we've done staffing to date. So I, well, and here's the other thing, right? As a service staff, we also have to think about the experience with the clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've had a lot of people like Web3 Native or even like kind of Web 2.5 or Web 2 who are like, oh, I've worked with DAOs. It's chaotic. Kind of like you're saying. It's like, it's too much. I don't want to deal with all these people. And I think that's where it's so important to recognize that we're early, right? It's 1% of the world is maybe in Web3, the other 99% out there. So for us to suddenly try and force this insane like chaos that is the traditional DAO would not be in our best interest as a business. So what we've done is we very much kind of position as a hybrid where for the client, uh, we're an agency in the front down the back is how I like to describe it. So for the, from the client experience, myself, Simon, my co-founder, and now Julie, who's, who she plays a couple different roles, but she's our like head operations account management. We work together as kind of account leads to work directly mm-hmm. with clients Help them understand what are you actually trying to accomplish uh, with your marketing growth objectives, right? What's the context of your business? What are you trying to drive towards? How can we help you? We put together an initial scope of work collaboratively, right? We work with them to say, hey, this is what we're thinking. Does it sound right? Here's the budget, timeline, deliverables. Work with them. Once we feel like it's in a good place, uh, we actually just recently set up this new staffing process where uh, what we do is as things get more real, we have a new leads channel. So we kind of post, hey, Here's what we're thinking about. Here's the latest. Uh, stay tuned. And then when things are like almost at the finish line and we're ready to like start staffing up people, what we then do is, you know, the account team, which is myself, Simon, and Julie, we then go to the DAO and say, hey, we are looking for these types of people, right? Growth manager or growth marketer, designer, content writer, whatever it is, right? Put that out. And then people have an opportunity, kind of like with the governance proposal, to submit their own rationale for why they're the best fit Mm where you know it's availability quality you know skill set we're trying to make sure that it's not the same people working on every project so have you worked on something are you new you know all these different factors they apply we take in all the applications or the you know people raising their hands look it over and then we'll make the selections and try and be, be as transparent about it as possible um so yeah and then we bring them on staff up the team and then boom, it's like any other agency client project, right? Um, and so that's the beauty. It's kind of like just because it's a DAO doesn't mean everything has to be done through smart contracts on chain, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, whatever. Like it's it's an organization mechanism uh, or it's a coordination mechanism, right? Um, and so we're trying to kind of leverage it for the best use cases while still making sure we run efficiently as a business and make sure our clients are happy and that we're doing the best work possible. Yeah. Right on. Now. Um, who have you found have more consistently mm-hmm. been the sort of clients that come to Myosin and want you all to do yeah. the work when they know that, for instance, what they've done traditionally is more of that agency model? So who is it that you all at this point have been yeah. working with? Yeah, so our clients have been all a, a little all over the place. And I think it's a good thing because, you know, again, like I said, we're all still so early, so we're all figuring it out. Uh, so some of them, we've got a couple metaverse players. So every realm, formerly Republic Crypto, we've worked with, uh, Mona. So they're one of the metaverse players mm-hmm. we've worked closely with right now. Some of our bigger clients are fashion league. So they're a web 2.5 game. Uh, so they're kind of like free to play and play to earn. I'm really excited about what they're doing because they're kind of, they're creating a different type. Because like I said, I think to create mainstream adoption, we need to kind of abstract away all this complication of, oh, we're on this blockchain and we use this protocol. Like, 
Web3 natives, sure, like we get it. But again, the other 99% of the world doesn't care. They don't give a fuck. They just want to be like, is this fun? Do I care? Why should I play it? Why should I use it? You know, it's the end. It's the end result, not the features that matter, right? What jobs to be done am I, am I really solving? Um, so Fashion League is one. We're currently working with kind of like an API uh, called Notify Network. So it's been all over the place. Um, so it's hard to say specifically like, oh, this mm-hmm. is one type of client. I would say for the most part, we kind of shy away from uh, simple like kind of PFP NFT drops. Um, obviously, that's like a hot space. Uh, although not right now, because the market's kind of drying up in general. Um, but I would say it's kind of number one, like the the teams we tend to work with are uh, a little bit further along than most, I would say, because simply because to be able to pay an agency uh, or a service DAO, like you do need a certain level of kind of uh, funding or income or cash mm-hmm. flow, right? And then I think in terms of the needs, uh, it's everything. So I think. You know, when we first started, it was more growth marketing oriented. But as we've evolved and kind of dove in deeper and deeper and deeper into the Web3 ecosystem properly, we've started to develop our own point of view around, you know, when it comes to Web3 marketing, you know, uh, and I wrote an article about this, which is on my, pinned on my Twitter, you know, in the traditional Web2 world, it's kind of very much like push marketing is how I describe it, where, mm. you know, you stand up a you have a product, you stand up a, a quick landing page, and then you just push out a shit ton of ads to basically convert and target and push people to your website and product and sell them. I think what's changed and what's very different about Web3 native marketing is um, crypto and Web3, it unlocks social networks, right? It's all about kind of word, it's, it's grassroots, it's word of mouth, it's viral, right? So what's really, what we're seeing is the new kind of marketing stack, as I like to describe it, it's Community content partnerships are like this holy trifecta that everyone needs to think about is like, who is your community? What do they care about? How are you actually assembling them? How are you engaging with them? Because depending on, you know, if you're DeFi DGENs, it's very different from, um, you're like an NFT community for uh, children. I don't know. Like, but the point is like, they're all different types of communities. They're not all the same. So who, who are your real, and it's just like in Web2, who are your customers? What do they care about? How are you engaging them? Are you going to where they live or are you trying to force them to do something else, which is a whole other thing. Then there's content where, you know, nobody likes ads, although I have a whole other take on that. But right now within Web3, like ads aren't very relevant. Um, So content is the new form of ads or it's the way to kind of get the word out. It's the way to help people buy into your project and join the community. So are you creating high quality content that truly explains, builds the lore, builds the narrative of who you are and why people should care? Are you feeding that to your community appropriately? Are you letting your community co-build that content, right? So that's the flywheel you need to activate there. And then partnerships, which is very much thinking through, well, okay, it's a small space. There's a lot of other people who share similar missions. Like, how are you collaborating uh, with other people within the ecosystem? Because within Web3, like, because it's a small space, everyone kind of needs to work together. That's kind of the whole ethos that I think we're all chasing after. Um, so focusing in, in on all those elements. And then I do think there's a role for paid, but they, that comes in a little bit later. I think mm-hmm. you need to be a slightly bigger company. Um, because like I said, that 1%, 99%, yeah, Web3 advertising isn't big, but the bigger you get you, to reach that other 99%, that's where they all live. In, in more traditional Web2 fiat land where advertising does still matter and it still is relevant. Um, it just depends on what scale you're at. Um, yeah. No, that, that makes a ton of sense. I, I like that trifecta model. Um, I think yeah. that's a good way for people to really also assess where they're at and where they can maybe pick up some of the slack of our, we do a great job community, but the content's lacking or the content's great. The community component's yeah. lacking to kind of give them some, some steps to follow. So uh, last two questions. So now we got to get you to your, to your next meeting. Uh, one, oh, okay. what would you say is like the, final form as you all see it right now of what yeah. you want myosin to be and then we can end off with any general advice or tips you would give to yeah. somebody who is trying to build something in this sector yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah i definitely have thoughts i might ask you to repeat that second one because the I got this you. next I got one you. Is a, a big one yeah. so yeah there's a big hairy vision for myosin so i think for us you know the the special sauce that i think has made this work so far is we are a pretty exclusive kind of like gated community. Um, we're only, you know, 
I want everyone to join, obviously. I want everyone to be happy, but at the end of the day, we have to be exclusive to kind of maintain, you know, uh, our level of quality. Um, that being said, you know, our goal is to kind of get to 150 people, uh, community members. So that's what, uh, many know as Dunbar's number, which is this, mm-hmm. it's a social psychology theory, basically that after 150 connections, it's hard to kind of maintain real meaningful relationships. And I want my son always feel like an intimate place where everyone, if you aren't best friends, you at least kind of recognize that person, you know, who other people are. I've been in a lot of different communities in web two and web three where it starts out pretty cool, you know, everyone, and then it gets like a thousand people. And even at a thousand, you're just like, I don't know anyone anymore. Like, how do I collaborate? Mm-hmm. And how do I work together? So that's interesting though, because our goal, and we always say is we want to become the web three WPP, uh, but a lot less evil and way more fun. So what that really means is what we're just trying to say is we have big ambitions to get there. Uh, the challenge is services don't scale, right? So if we want to be truly global and you know, churning millions of dollars in annual revenue. Um, we can't do that with only 150 members. It's, it's, we can deliver a lot of work for 150 members, but it's not going to be as big as we want. So that being said, I think I just see, you know, the services is like the core of the business, but we kind of have all these outer circles that we're thinking about. So services is kind of what drives it. It's the cash flow. It's, it's the core of Myosin. But products are what we're really thinking about and why I always describe my as growth marketing DAO and product studio. So we're actually building out different types of marketing products that, again, as someone who's building companies in Web2 for a while now, I feel like the towards the end of my venture design career, it was challenging because you're like, so many areas have already been disrupted and there are already yeah. players who are crushing it. But in Web3, and then there's a question like, well, how do I innovate? How do I do something better? And it's like, there wasn't much. Um, but now... Um, with Web3, there's just, it's just blue ocean. There's just so much opportunity because if you truly believe this is the future of the internet, like I do, um, you know, that this is where you need to be building. This is where all the opportunity is because blockchain and Web3 fundamentally shift, you know, the business models, the economics, the incentive structures for, and it's going to touch literally everything. Um, because we talk about it now as like some separate thing Mm -hmm. because it's that 1% versus 99. But just like we saw with direct consumer, eventually those two worlds will collide and they will converge and they will be the same thing. It's a matter of when, right? Next five years, 10 years, 20 years, we don't know, but it will happen. I I can promise you that. Um, So for us, we want to build those products, right? And the cool thing is as we build Web3 native marketing products, uh, you know, we'll have customers that we can cross sell to our clients and we have clients who can cross sell to our customers and they can kind of feed into each other, helping each other grow and, and be better. And then we're thinking about education. So again, as more people come into this space, I can tell you right now, like the Web3 marketing world is incredibly tiny. Like uh, there's so many instances where I've met this person and they're like, oh, do you know? And just everyone knows each other because I would I would hazard to guess that there's probably less than like a couple thousand of us in the world right now kind of focused mm-hmm. on Web3 marketing like full time. Um, probably even less, maybe like a thousand if that. Um, so we need more. Right. Because I always say, like, to reach product market fit, you don't need just a good product. You need good marketing, good storytelling, good growth tactics. Right. Um, I've seen it many times. Like, you can have a shitty product and a great marketing team and you'll crush it. And that's how you can win. Right. So, we need more marketers to get there. We want to eventually, this is kind of like a next year thing, is start up an academy, like a Myosin Academy. But the cool part there is whether or not we choose to monetize, that's another question. That academy, um, what it really becomes is a talent pipeline where we're already working on services and products. If we can actually spin up the education, bring more people into the space, the top one to top 5%, we can actually say, hey, you're Magna Cum Laude in Myosin Academy. Do you, we'd like to extend you a membership uh, into mm-hmm. Myosin where you can actually directly work on these services. You know, you can help us improve our products. You can, And then that further increases the quality of the DAO members, which then feeds into everything else. And it's like this beautiful flywheel. And then the very last bit I always like to talk about is um, is investment, right? So services and products feed each other. Education continues to increase the quality of the, the core. And then investment is kind of what allows us to invest in ourselves and our community through grants and proposals, as well as eventually start to make outside acquisitions uh, of you know those early stage marketing tools that we're talking about and saying, hey, you could do this yourself. 
or you could work with one of the largest and you know most prestigious kind of web three marketing collect brain trust and power or, or brain trust, right? Because we have the people doing the work, we have the people building the products, we have the education. That makes us a far better investor and value add than your typical VC, which having come from that world, I can tell you a lot of those guys are just they they have a Twitter account and a lot, they just post a lot and their finance, their finance bros just you know, wearing Patag- you know, wearing Patagonia or whatever. Right. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's kind of the big hairy roadmap. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I need you to remind me of the second question after that. I forget. Honestly, the, that was just about advice for founders, but you've given them a ton. Uh, and yeah. I know we got a hard stop to get you to the meeting. So, um, yeah, man, this has been amazing. You've covered a lot and I definitely yeah. know that we can, we, we should have a part two, uh, yeah. in a few months time to check in on what y'all are doing. So, if you could, Blake, let the people know where they can find you and how they can get in contact yeah. and work with Myosa. Yeah. Um, so my DMs are always open uh, on Twitter. So you can hit me up at Blake Minho Kim, B-L-A-K-E-M-I-N-H-O-K-I-M. You could always check out Myosin. Our, the Twitter page for Myosin is Myosin, M-Y-O-S-I-N underscore X-Y-Z. Um, just being transparent, we are still taking applications, but we're kind of slowing down the acceptance right now uh, as we just focus on growing. Um, I think we're pretty happy with our membership base, but we are going to do a pretty big refresh uh, of like everything from the website is a little bit outdated at this point to our capabilities deck. We have a big overhaul of like our application inflows right now um, because right now a lot of people are going through like this big type form. But like I said, we're, we're kind of migrating to a new structure very soon. Um, but yeah, always ping me on uh, Twitter or Myosin at Twitter. And, uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to, you know, hearing, hearing from everyone and thanks so much for having me on. This is a great conversation. Yeah. yeah. I learned a ton, man. And, uh, and thank you. And I look forward <laughs> to the next one, Blake. We'll talk to you soon, brother. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Peace.